uh, as a strategic focus for ACE is the smart utilities. We do a lot of control systems, PLCs, SCADA, and industrial communications. It's very relevant to what you are learning from this unit as well. Over the years, we do observe the general trends from which different industries are using different type of control systems. So for example, we got in the water industry here in Australia, it use a lot of Schneider PLCs, M580 and M340. And also, uh, it uses a SCADA pack RTUs as well for the telemetry side. And the power industry is uh, it's a different um, type of beasts. Uh, because of the restriction of the power system industry, they need communication, stringent communication and stringent data transmission. So we noticed a lot of uh, D20, G, D25 RTUs being used in the power system industry, specifically in the substation switch rooms. RTU560, strictly used by Rio Tinto here in WA for their power stations and substations here. Uh, Eaton SMP RTUs become more and more popular with Horizon Power and Western Power. SEL RTEC PLCs is also start to pick up client space as well. And the last but not least, the Schneider Talus T100 RTUs. In the transport, Industry, Schneider is dominating PLCs here, uh, used by the PTA and over East as well. There are some Allen Bradley communication uh, and the PLCs used mining. Schneider is also uh, a pretty heavily used GE, specifically used by FMG here in WA and Siemens in various the packaged system as well. In coming to the oil and the gas, uh, oil and the gas use a lot of Siemens DCS and Yokogawa DCS. Honeywell and Amazon DCS. So if you want to develop yourself into the oil and the gas industry, you, you, you better learn about DCS. DCS is very similar to control system and SCADA, but it's a different type of system. It's more of a distributed control system versus the PLC and the SCADA server. So between the PLCs and the SCADA server, there's an empty void here, which where the communication need to happen to, to transmit the data between the PLCs and the SCADA server. And the longer distance is, the harder it becomes to maintain the data integrity here. So fair enough, we can, get a, we can get a communication talking within a laboratory environment, at home or on the bench, or even a, within a couple of kilometers. But if we stretch the distance to a thousand, up on a thousand kilometers apart, then everything starts falling apart. For example, the time delay for the retransmissions, for the timeout, for example, the bandwidth. All of this has to be in, within consideration of your SCADA and control system design. And these all fall into the industrial communications. It's very, very important area to consider because that's how we're getting the data transmitted from the site. I did discuss with Dr. Uh, Octavia before the lecture and the uh, he wanted this to be strategically focused on the industrial communication because that's the uh, uh, area that he believes can bring a lot of value to, to everyone here in this classroom. So I prepared a couple of slides focused on DMP3. And the reason is, you can see in the, in the water industry, the power industry, transport, industry and oil and gas industry, DMP3 is the number one communication protocol. There are some other communication protocols is such as Modbus, OPC UA, and 6150 and 104, Ethernet IP, and some proprietary protocols as well. This is the fundamental about DMP3. A DMP3 is an object-oriented communication protocol. You see they have a different groups, object groups and object variations. Why do we have these objects here? Does anyone want to give it a try you know, to answer this question? Yes, please. Because um, you're looking for changes in those states. So if you group them into common states, then you can just check the changes. And they occur. So yep. you know it's within the binary section, it's within the counter section. Yeah, very good. It's more efficient yep. Yep. 
Great. Sorry, what, may, I, may I please have your name? Uh, Harry. Harry. Okay. okay, very good, Harry. You got, you know, Dr. Otavia, you got a lot of potential in this classroom. <laughs> so you're very good, Heron. So this, all of this object is designed to have a maximized communication efficiency. And the other reason is that it's easier for diagnosis as well. So if anything, the communication goes wrong, there's the data not being arrived on time or missed, and easy for the engineer to diagnose, it can narrow down to the root causes. Uh, you may have noticed I've highlighted the, the word time in red. Uh, anyone wants to give it a crack on this reason why we got a time here in red? Okay, Heron, okay, Heron again. <laughs> when you want to send with time, um, you need like a local timestamp, right? So you need like a local um, and remote. Accurate time source. Accurate time source, yep. Yeah. Yeah. You're very good, Heron. Let's step back a little bit. Let's go to the bigger picture. You know, we are in the same classroom, but we, you, you're talking to your parents from home. You might, there might be a few kilometers away. If you're talking to your friends from overseas, there might be a, you know, two, two or three thousand kilometers away. Or if you're talking people from our space, if you, you know, if you can, that there's you know, the far greater distance. When the communication generators, that's when you speak something, that's communication started. Until the time the, the communication being received by a, a person from a different location, it's happened at a different time frame. It does not happen instantaneously. Yet even if we're speaking in the classroom here, when I, by the time when you receive my voice, there's, also, there's already a time delay there. So DMP3 allowed for the time stamped on the event when it happens. So give it exactly record of what's happened. Okay, the time happened when you deliver the information. And that's a crucial for process control. Because in the process control, it's all about the sequence of events. Yeah. If, all, if everybody in this classroom try to speak to me, I will lose record of you know, who does what. But if you all have a time stamp on it, I can then sequence the event. I can put them into the order. And then I can show the nice trains or charts on the graphic of a scatter screen. Okay, this person said that, that person said that, that person has said that. I can plot a account or history of it. So that's why the DMP3 is, is a time-based protocol. You can switch it off if you want to, the time that, you know, that, that feature, but usually in the utilities environment, the time feature is always turned on. So the scatter server will know exactly what's happening in the field. With that explained, you, you notice there's objects called time and dates here. Does anyone want to try to answer why, you know, question why you have an object of time and date there? So to log the time, the events Want to log the time, yeah. Yep, yep, that's right. So, so that's, I, I think you're on the right track. Sorry, what's your name? Jeremy. Darren, okay. Jeremy. Darren, okay. Uh, you are you're definitely, absolutely on the track. So time and date, so time and dates is the objects used by the both DMP3 master and slave to exchange time information. You know, in the old days, you know, in, in about, back to about 25 years ago, there's no smart watches, there's no smartphones. You have to tune your watch. You know, you have to tune your watch. So look, I've, I've, I'm going to have to watch TV at uh, 7 o'clock or you know, 8 o'clock to tune my watch to be the same time. So that is exactly what this object is for. That's what, the, that's what the DMP3 master to use to send out the time and dates objects records to the, all the slaves to tune the time to synchronize all the slaves in the networks. Say, so, okay, that's, your current, that's, that's my current times. Now you can, you, you can work out your local time. So we call it remote time, sent out by the DMP3 master to all the slaves for the slave to work out the local time. Why I use the word work out? It's not just accepting. Does anyone know why the, word, why the local DMP3 RTUs or our station need to work out the local time? So there is delay. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry, what's your name? 
Gio. Gio. Okay, very good. Uh, excellent students. <laughs> okay, so you need to work out the difference because there is a time delay to different location, different transmission node. So for this, the slave cannot passively accept the time because they will, then the time will, will be wrong. Like it, take, it may take one second for the, mes for the message to arrive to any slave. Then they will create a discrepancy in the uh, integrity of the data. But the Scala server will work out the time delay. Okay, here you go. Based on this measurement, I know you have, we have a one second delay between us. Now, I'm gonna send you my time and you can add that one second on top of your time record. Right. What if the slave moved the location? You know, what if all of a sudden, is that Gio? You, you know, you move out of this office, out of this classroom, you move down into, the, down into the shopping center. You know, what if the location moved? Now the delay moved. So what if that happens? Anyone else want to try, you know, try to answer this question? Just recalculates. Recalculates, yeah. Constant sending time, yeah, so yeah. So that given time, like one minute. Okay, that that that's pretty good. So the master can be configured to constantly or to, to periodically send out time delay and time record to all the slaves or to any specific specific slaves. So does does this have a cycle? As in, the, after every every cycle or a particular information that's been sent. So the master and slave, they again uh, communicate regarding the delay. So is there a cycle that happens oftenly so that the, there's uh, more kind of uh, communication, right? Correct, yeah, 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 so, uh, yes, yeah, exactly right. So, sorry, what's your name, please? Uh, Shail. Shail, okay, very good. So there is a cyclic communication you can configure in the SCADA pack RTU or the GeoSCADA to to receive or send a time record periodically. And usually on the R station, on the RT startup, the master knows it will send out the time straight away or the slave will request the time as well from the master as a part of the communication handshaking on the startup process. Shale, uh, to add to Shale's comments, there's on top of that, the RTUs or the DMP R station, it usually have the feature to request time from the master as well, just in case. There is a, uh, there's a specific setting in the E-series configurator to periodically, you know, you know, to do that. So every, say for example, every half hour or every 24 hours request, or tell, okay, tell me the time please, and the master will then send the time record down. So it's very, it's, it's very important. The communication, industrial communication is all about management of the bandwidth and management of the record and management of, you know, of the data integrity. So DMP3 has a unique structure of setting up a different class and events for each, every single data or record here. So did anyone know, has a prior knowledge of what the class and events entail? Okay, Krish, now I'm gonna, now gonna test uh, you know, your, your knowledge base now. class <coughs> Yeah. The class is obviously not a social class, but you can understand you can understand that way. It is if you put a, a social class into the same concept. Priorities. Pri priorities. Yeah, that's right. Priority boarding. Okay. So when you go on the Qantas or any airplanes, you got priority boarding. You got business. You got first class, business class. So now a different class you can configure them has different priority, has different different polling regimes, different transmission schemes, and different timeouts as well. Do you treat them differently? And why do we want to do that for for the data? You know, why do we want to do that? Reduce complexity. Yeah. Reduce complexity. Any other reasons? Sorry, you yeah. Criticality. Process criticality. Based on the process criticality. Criticality, yeah, you're very good. And importance, yeah. Any other reasons? Okay, very good. That that you know that's plenty. You know that that's exactly uh, shows the caliber of these 
class here, very, very uh, intelligent, smart. You know, you guys got a great potential here. So you know, overall, put an event a class in place is for better control of the data. So the master wants to control the data the way that depends on the priority, depends on the criticality, depends on how important the data is to the specific operator or the clients. So you've got a class zero, one, two, and three here, okay? Different, different class, the class is also an object by itself. For example, when the DMP3 master or GeoSCADA server configures to pose the slave every 10 minutes for the class zero data, the slave will respond with all the class zero data uploaded to the master server. Same as class one, two, and three and internal indication and binary commands as well. So that way you can rationalize your, your alarms or data into different groups. You can say, look, for, for example, with the pump station running status, I want to call it class two data because it's, yes, it's, it's good to know, but it's not that critical. You know, the pump start and stop all the time. It pump fault, however, I want it to be class one data because it's critical. Uh, the, the customer wants to know it. If the pump is faulty, you want to send people out to fix the pump straight away without, with minimum delay. And class zero data could be commands. We, we now go down to rabbit hole more and more. So it's a blue pill or, or red pill now. <laughs> Although there's no blue or, blue or red, it's, it's indeed a rabbit hole here. We can delve more and more into it. And you kind of, that can become, that's the real gist of doing engineering. You become very, very interested and you delve more into the specific area. So now we, we're going to go into the communication hierarchy of DMP3. So here, we've got a conventional DMP3. It's called multi-drops. DMP3 master talking to multiple slaves. The slaves here can be the scanner pack RTUs, or it can be any other intelligent electronic devices with the DMP3 slave driver. It can be all acting as a DMP3 slave. It's a very common structure, and I believe that structure you have in your uh, control system lab as well. Now we have another hierarchy here. Okay, is we, on top we got a DMP3 master, multi-drop to two slaves, and that slaves can be acting as a DMP3 master and multi-drop further down to more slaves. It's growing like trees here. And then one of the slaves can be a master, it can, it can go further down and down. The third one is called multi-master configuration. So you've got two DMP3 masters talking to single slaves here. There is a word that you can't serve two masters at the same time, but in the DMP3 world, that's possible. You can serve two masters or three masters, up to 254 masters. So literally, everyone in this classroom can be the master. You know, I can be your slave. And then the final configuration is called peer-to-peer -peer communications here, okay? The peer-to-peer -peer communication happen between master and slave, so it's basically it's a one-to-one -one communication, but industrial devices like Scatterpack RTUs, the communication can happen between slave and slaves as well. It's called peer-to-peer -peer communication. So that's where some real-life example is that that's what interlocks can be used for. When you have an interlocks between two sides, you can configure the peer-to-peer -peer communications. For example, if you've got a water tank at one place and pump station at another place, if the tank level goes low, it will, call, it will send message to the pump station to start the pump, pumping more water into the tank. That message can be configured as a PDP communication. Any questions? Yes? If there is multiple masters, how to get a sign with the, the prior to the master? Same masters, the same classes. Sometimes, which the order, same order classes. So, which one do the operators should be assigned? Which one is the first priority for 
those the two masters upset. So, uh, so I, okay, so I'll just repeat your question. Eugene is, uh, you say, would, is that a priority between the masters, yeah. is it? Or? Yeah, so, the, so that's a very good question, uh, you know, Eugene. So there's, there's no priority between the masters. Mm -hmm. However, there's a way to, within the slave, to configure the message to be sent to different masters. You can, you can, you know, you know, you, know, you can mute the specific message to one master and open the communication to another masters. You can say, look, I've got a pump station fault here. I want to send it to a specific master, out of, uh, your master one. I don't want to send this alarm to master two, so you can do that as well. So that that will come. That was part of the engineering design process, as uh, your Changa has in introduced earlier on. It's all up to the clients, SCADA operator, or the clients manager, or the clients, you know, preference or which master they you know they want to receive the alarms. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, like in all of the cases you are explaining, there are multiple uh, slaves connected to the master, so which means basically there will be multiple processes controlled by a single master. So is there any redundancy concept applied here? Because like if there is a communication break between the master and slaves, so the entire slaves, uh, the process handled by the slaves are going to be affected. So is there any redundancy in between the master and slave? So that if one communication link breaks, the second should take over. Because otherwise, it's not a robust communication. Yeah, so yeah. OK, very, very good question. hardware based, like in PLC, we have yeah. a redundancy concept. Yeah. Like, is there any software redundancy also applied? OK, very good. OK, very good. Uh, that's a very deep question. So showing that you have, a, you have already got a, a, a very sound understanding of control system and communication as well. Appreciate that. So the, the question is, uh, if it's a communication breaks here, is there any redundancy if, or is there any way to recover the data? So the redundancy is mainly is to build to recover the data. So it doesn't matter how it works. As long as data is recoverable, you know, that is acceptable. So in the DMP3 network environment, the structure we see, there's no physically you know, it's a redundant methodology here. You know, can see it's all, is, you know, uh, it's pretty much just an A to B communication here. But, in, you know, within the DMP3 protocol itself, there is a type of uh, mechanism, it's called report by exception. Also, it's called buffered event. When the communication breaks here, the master <coughs> loses the communication to the slaves. And the slave will then continue to buffer all the events, you know, all the what's happening on site. For example, pump fault, pump running, uh, uh, hydraulic fault, you know, earth fault, plant fault, or the you know the, the, the tank low alarm. So all of this information are registered, still registered in the our station's buffer. And the DMP3 our station's buffer usually can be configured to a very large quantity. Uh, in number of quantities. So for example, 50,000 events that can be used for storing the data for you know, over weeks. And when the communication link is restored, okay, the DMP3 slave then be able to upload the, the record of information to the master. And that's what we consider as the way to recover the data here. With the DMP3, generally you, you, know, you don't see a RAIN network. You know, for example, with the Ethernet RP, the, you, will, you observe the engineer will design network to be the RAIN, so they can connect from A to B in the RAIN, connect all the nodes together. DMP3, usually you don't see that, because DMP3 has inbuilt functionality to store the event and upload the event on communication recovery. Okay, did that answer your question? Any other questions before we move on? All right, let's go. next one. <coughs> okay, so on top of these uh, slides here, there's some um, example screens for SCADA. So one is a local touch panel. 
not local, not all the touch panel is, co is considered as SCADA, but some of them are, as long as you can issue the commands out, you know, and store the historic data in the same panel and then plot the chart, that you can consider that as a SCADA because SCADA is a supervisory control and data acquisition. So you need to do, sup you need to do the monitoring, you need to do the control, and you need to do data acquisition. And you need to be able to, to store the data as well, to display the trains. So, so you got the local server here. The local server usually is a very popular for all the plans. For example, mining, pretty much all the SCADA servers are local server here. And also process plans. The wide area SCADA is you know, terminology that we, you know, we've created. The wide area SCADA is more of, uh, for the remote operators. What we call remote, uh, called wide area SCADA. I thought this is the market segments will be useful for everyone here. You got water, you got power, you got transport, you got mining, and you got oil and gas. Those, those, those are the popular SCADA software used in those industry segments. Okay, any other questions? Um, why does transport just use uh, SciTech SCADA? No other SCADA is just SciTech. For what reason? Just why, is it more easier or the configuration is more easier or I don't know. But there's, for mining you have like N numbers, for oil you have, for power you have. It's just transport that just uses SciTech SCADA. That's right, yeah. yeah. That is a very good question, and I can see that so why... Uh, yeah, I may not have all the answers for you at, the, you know, at this stage, but based on my you know, uh, industry experience, the, the SciTech SCADA is, is almost the first modern SCADA package that came out to Australia. And all of a sudden, SciTech was, cr was invented, was created, and then, and then become a sort of graphical interface, you know, drag and drop, you know, it feels like Windows. So people really quickly jump onto it. And, it's, and the SciTech SCADA remains market domination for, you know, for the pretty much the first 10 years and still a very, very popular software nowadays. And so when, when that happens, so the transport uh, companies start using the SciTech as well. And the transport industry is a very conservative industry. You know, although we want the train to move faster than we think, the industry itself is very slow moving. Uh, once it's developed the SciTech library, uh, the objects or the you know, genie or super genie, that's been proven working for the rails, the leadership within industry were very reluctant to move on to something new that potentially causing havoc to, you know, to the public. Okay, thank you for the question. Any other questions? So what is the physical distance limitation for the DNB3 protocol? Like, uh, as per my understanding, for the, like the longer distance communication and all, I understand that IC61850 is used as a protocol, or 104 protocol is used. So is the DNP just restricted to the certain area, or is there any distance limitation? And second is, what type of physical link do you use in DNP link. And what is the distance limitation for the DNP protocol? Right, okay, very good question. Sorry, may I, may I have your name, please? Uh, I'm Ugin. Ugin. Uh, Ugin, okay, very good. Yeah, that's all. You know, thank you for your good question here. Yeah. So the question is, uh, what is the uh, distance limitation for DNP3 uh, versus you know, Modbus? And that's a very good question. I actually created a couple of videos on YouTube, so feel free to watch that you know, in the weekend if you feel very bored. To have a really short answer is uh, there's, no, there's, no there's no limitation for DMP3. That this, you, you can use it to communicate to whatever distance RTUs or PLCs or IEDs you want it, but that is all 
everything is possible in theory, but in practice, there are some guidelines there. So from engineering point of view, I would always recommend the clients to use DMP3 when it considers to a long distance communications. You know, for example, you know, up, on, up to you know, 100 kilometers away from the operator, between the operator and the plants or the assets. For the shorter distance, you can use DMP3. For example, a, a process plan, you can use DMP3 to communicate between the PLCs and you know, SATEX got a server into the PLCs. So that is not a, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, to me, that is incorrect selection of the protocol because DMP3 is, a, is a relatively heavy uh, on overheads. So you look at a DMP3 communication packet, the frame of DMP3 is very large. This overhead, what we call overhead information, packed into one single packet, it's not a very efficient protocol that way. And uh, you wouldn't want to use that for your local communication because if it's a short distance, you want to, you know, you know, you're not going to be bothered about overhead. You, you just want the information itself. Which, that's where Modbus become advantageous because Modbus does have very low overhead. It's only got a, you know, RC, uh, your CRC check-in is a master slave address. And that's it. The rest of them are just the information itself. The biggest difference between Modbus and DMP3 is the time record. The, the Modbus does not offer the time record as we described before, so you would not have your, you would have tend to lose your traceability if, the, if something happened within your network, or something if this, uh, um, for example, the communication failure, you then lose your record of sight of what's happening. With DMP3. It maintains the time record for you, maintain the maintains the traceability for client's data, which is the data is the crucial thing, which will, uh, you know, we will touch that, uh, the topic of data later on as well. It's, it's the crucial asset. So, the, so data become the critical asset for every company, for every country, for every person as well. Okay, right. We're gonna go dig down into the rabbit hole more start becoming mind-boggling. That's what you sign up for here. <laughs> That's what you want to do on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> okay, so, so this is a, a typical SCADA network design here that we have produced and it's used by many, many clients. It's a, one of the typical uh, SCADA network design here. So as you can see, okay, so it, from the side, from remote side point of view, you've got a VSD variable speed drive, you've got other IEDs, electronics, uh, in, uh, intelligent electronics devices, you've got actuator, and you've got a smart instruments, flow meter, pressure meter, chlorine analyzers, uh, turbidity meters. It can all communicate to the PLC or R station. And there's some other PLCs here, here as well. The communication path on top is that from the R station, you go through a router and go to a a radio network or serial network or a fiber optic network. That's just one example of radio or microwave communication network into another router and then into the firewall, into the corporate server here and the backup server and the permanent backup server. And then the information is going to be in, will end up in the data historian or data warehouse for the long-term storage that we're talking about 10 years, up to 10 years or 20 years storage of the data. Okay, so the, the second communication path down there is the PLC is going to the firewall, going through the LTE or cellular network or satellites or least communication lines. So, uh, and then into the, into the router goes through the firewall and up to the SCADA server. So this is the typical setup of DMP3 network. Any questions before we move on? Right, no problems. Now let's, let's get ready for, the, for even more complex network. Right, look at that. This is, in a nutshell, is the map of entire SCADA network that's used in almost every organization here. 
it is, it, it'll be literally too hard to explain every detail here. I just want to show you this is uh, a various communications here. So you got radio communication, and then you have, you know, you have a satellite, you have a next year, you have a DSL, you have a WAN over fiber communication. These are all different communication methods. And also they have each site have a different components as well. You would have some local LAN here, or you don't have a LAN here, you just have a, an, an RTU here to connect everything up. Or you have a, a, a group of PLCs here. It's like mining, you know, process plan or the mine, or the mine sites, the typical mine sites, we have a, a group of PLCs here, a local server, okay? And it's managed primarily locally by the local operators. Some critical alarms is remotely monitored by the remote operator, you know, just in case. Yes. Have you seen any 5G application in this scale network? 5G. 5G. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's a very good question. So the, the uh, has anyone used the 5G at the moment? You put your hands up. Uh, no one used the 5G yet. Okay. Okay. Use 5G. You know, what do you think about 5G at the moment? It's very fast. Okay. Very. <laughs> yeah, I like your answer. There you go. Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll be surprised if it's not fast. So, <laughs> you know, with the 5G networking, it, 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 um, it will have to be changed out to a brand new antenna. Uh, the in communication infrastructure has to be there to allow the 5G communication, or a really good 5G communication. Uh, for example, in this classroom, it will have a 5G antenna here to, to, to do the transmit and receive as well. So. Uh, that enable really fast 5G <coughs> communication. If it relies on the traditional repeaters to, you know, you know, like 4G or LTE, that, that 5G communication will be still faster than 4G, but it's not exponentially faster. Uh, and then the industrial automation and communication side, there are some 5G modem has been developing as we speak, but none of them has been commercialized yet. Uh, there are various reasons, like the availability of the infrastructure is not there. The client's not going to be purchased that if there's no, there's, you know, there's no communication structure there. Compared to other industries like retails, you know, advertisements, uh, medias, uh, all, all those other industries, the SCADA industry is relatively conservative. Five minutes break? Okay, let, let's have a five minutes break. Feel free to grab this uh, PowerPoint slide as well if, you, if you're interested. And, you know, we, we can have a chat as well if you want to. All right, let's have, is that okay, Dr. Octavia? Have five minutes break? All right, thanks.